مهم أنا سمعت نيو هان ولكن دبل دبليو لأنه نيو هي محمد آل ماسل ماي is taking computer classes and learning everything from how to build a computer game to coding. I didn't know anything about computer. Like all I had, I I know is like opening Facebook and stuff. Nineteen-year-old Syrian Al Masalme fled to Lebanon six years ago after his father was shot and killed in Syria. This is changing my life. This is actually changing my life. Before this program, I didn't see myself in the future. Now I guess I can see myself trying to to just finish my study and like find any job that would make money for me to live. Run by the United Nations World Food Program, WFP, this digital skills training program brings together Lebanese people with displaced Syrians, providing classes four days a week to improve their English and computer literacy. Participants are also given a small stipend for living expenses. But what does this have to do with food? What's the line between food and online skills? You can give a person a fish or you can teach them a fish. Paul Skochilis works for WFP, which has been fighting hunger since 1961. The organization provides food assistance to roughly 87 million people in 83 countries each year. The link between learning things like digital skills, learning about computer literacy, is that then you could provide for your own family, um, either now or in the future, and you won't need food assistance in the future if we can build up enough resilience and there are those economic opp opportunities for you. And that's a really the only sustainable uh, solution in the long term. The key thing is we're Sustainability is at the heart of WFP's innovation goals, which aim to use technology and digital approaches to advance beyond traditional forms of providing food aid. There are 1.5 million displaced Syrians living in Lebanon, but there are no official refugee camps. They live throughout the country. Some live in urban environments, like this apartment where Al Masalme lives with his mother, while others live in tents. So many have fled here that roughly one out of every four people in Lebanon is a refugee. And with the unemployment rate for the Lebanese themselves hovering around 25 percent, the government has made it illegal for refugees to work in most sectors. We have to come up with ideas that hasn't been thought of and that provides new solutions for both the refugees and the Lebanese. Robbie Shibli is the director of the Center for Civic Engagement at the American University of Beirut. He developed the digital skills classes with WFP. I fully believe that this program whereby you can deliver skills, train the refugees and Lebanese on these digital skills where they can connect to employers outside the country with its very limited job opportunities, it's a great idea. The idea is that refugees can remotely tap into work abroad and make money for food without taking jobs away from Lebanese. <laughs> Reem Hussein Hajouz is a mother of two and lives here with her family. Until now, she had never taken English or computer classes. Do you want to use these skills here in Lebanon or somewhere else? I can use them anywhere. I feel very proud of myself now because I am learning and I am knowledgeable. But there are challenges to the program. While more than 90 percent of Syrian refugee households have access to a mobile phone, for some, accessing computers is difficult. The main problem I face is that I do not have a computer at home. So if I learn something at the center and want to come home and practice it or type it up, I don't have a computer to do that. Another challenge? Running the program consistently. For now, it's on a break. But the WFP is planning to resume it in March. There's also the issue of scaling it up. So far, only 1,300 Syrian refugees in Lebanon have taken these classes. Is this really going to solve anything on a big scale? It's a start. It's not just about growth, it's about showing what works. And if this works, then we can replicate it in other countries. And remember that everyone who takes part in this has about five or six people at home. What is your favorite season? What we are learning in English and in computers is helping me to educate my children. They used to ask me, Mom, can you help me with this question in English? And I would say, I don't know how to help. Now I am able to provide my children with what they need. 
Not everything, but the simple basic things. WFP is working on additional digital innovations with more immediate and scalable impacts, like this cell phone app called Delili. The app helps refugees find deals on food. They can type in all of the food they need to buy, and it shows them where to go for the cheapest price. Ali Hamad uses the app before doing her monthly grocery shopping. Are you saving money? Have you noticed any difference in the amount of money you're spending on food compared to before you had the app? Yes, the aid we used to receive wasn't enough and wasn't lasting long. With the Dalili app, I can get what I want and the quantity I need. In Lebanon, Dalili has more than 27,000 downloads and more than 400 participating stores are on the app. This shop owner says sales have increased by more than 15 percent. He also has access to better pricing on the food he stocks because of WFP's connections to wholesale vendors and distributors. What's the real innovation taking place here? Apps have been around for a while. I think what's innovative is that we're using an app that really empowers the poorest and most vulnerable people to be you know, making good economic decisions for their family. Do you ever receive specials, uh, promotions from the stores on the app? WFP holds regular focus groups with refugees to ask them what is and isn't working, so we can make adjustments to the app accordingly. So we just want to ask you about some new features we might be adding. The Lili originally launched in Lebanon, and the lessons learned here helped the WFP launch the app in Kenya and Jordan as well. Shoklis says the Lili highlights a major change in the way food aid has evolved. In the past, you always saw big food parcels moving from food surplus countries, on ships, airdrops, on trucks, moving to places that had famines, that had food insecurity, war zones, after earthquakes, things like that. And the new way of doing things, instead of shipping the food, we're buying it locally. And the benefit of that is that it helps harness the power of the markets, which exist in Lebanon, to serve the poorest people, the vulnerable people, the, the, the refugees who are coming across the border. Jordan is home to nearly 3 million refugees, which makes up roughly 30 percent of the country's population. The refugees here come from various countries, including Iraq, Palestine, Libya, Iran, and more than 650,000 of them are Syrian refugees that fled their country's civil war. 80 percent of Syrian refugee households here struggle with what's called food insecurity, the inability to secure reliable access to affordable, nutritious food. This surge in population combined with the dry, harsh weather, makes growing enough food here extremely difficult. In order to feed the entire population, Jordan has to import 90 percent of its food. And as for water, it's running out. Jordan faces water scarcity. Even drinking water is not always available. Jordan is one of the most water-scarce countries in the world. Khaled al hissa is a director in Jordan's Ministry of Agriculture. Syrian refugees have increased the demand and pressure on the natural resources we have in Jordan. The government has to think outside the box. This is definitely one of the in this case, that means trying to find a better way of growing food. To do it, the country is working with the United Nations World Food Program. Jacqueline de Groot is head of WFP's Jordan program. This unit grows barley hydroponically, using water but no soil. The barley is used as animal feed. So the seeds are put here in one of the trays. After a couple of days, the seeds immediately start growing, and you can already see some sprouting happening. Wow. The seeds are placed in trays and watered for just 30 seconds a day. In seven days, the barley is fully grown. And in a country given to droughts, this uses 90 percent less water than traditional methods do. So this is at the end of the cycle, so this is ready to be eaten by the animals. So you're trying to roll this out for refugees living in tents? This high-tech unit is really meant to do the research so we know the best way to roll it out into much smaller low-tech units that are locally sourced, that are much cheaper obviously, and therefore this can be rolled out in the whole country. Got it. So it's high-tech now, so it can be low-tech later. Exactly. The low-tech hydroponic units consist of simple plastic walls with rows of bins inside. They produce lush, green fodder used to feed animals, including cows and camels. 
One key component of this program is teaching local refugees how to grow the food and maintain the units themselves. We wash the seeds, we plant it, and we harvest it one week later. We sell the barley and we make money. When I first came to Jordan, the living conditions were very difficult. Thankfully, things got better. I started working in hydroponics and then things at home improved. So far, WFP is running its hydroponics program for refugees in seven countries. The influx of refugees in this country has put a burden on the already tight job market, so creating employment opportunities is critical. In Jordan, the hydroponics program has created 177 jobs. Did you ever imagine that you'd one day be farming with hydroponics? No, I never thought I would work in hydroponics or anything like that. Did you have any experience in farming in your life? Yes, we used to plant in our home in Syria, but that was traditional farming, not hydroponics. We came here and there were people already working on the project. They trained us well, so I didn't face any difficulty at all. This 21st century system of growing food represents WFP's push to use new technological approaches to providing food aid. More than 100,000 Syrian refugees live inside camps. The camps are so big, in fact, that they have regular supermarkets where people go to buy food with monthly stipends provided by WFP. People choose what they want and make their way through the crowds, but it's the checkout line that makes this supermarket unusual. The refugees use their eyes to pay through iris scans. The scans are verified remotely by WFP, which keeps track of everyone's accounts. So they look into a little camera, which is an iris scan. The camera records their irises, verifies this is indeed the person that is allowed to do the shopping, and then the payment is done. So it's basically the same thing that, we, that people use in airports, where you have the iris scan systems, and now it's also developed in a way that, for example, we use it in supermarkets. It's biometrics in a sense. It's, uh, it's futuristic. It is the future. We see it more and more. It also makes it harder for people's money to get stolen because they are the only ones that can access it with their eyes. It is a safe and secure way to ensure that the people that have received the money are also the people that are buying the food. Nearly 500,000 refugees are using this in Jordan. Takrot says that there is no silver bullet for providing food aid to refugee populations, but using advances in technology is an important step towards ensuring everyone has access to food. In a place like this where you can see there is absolutely nothing else, nothing grows here. People have nothing else but the aid that they're getting. It is very important for us to keep innovating. Innovations really help us being efficient, being relevant and making sure that we can provide the best aid that we possibly can.